Here come our faces. Carol, your jargon is impeccable. <laughs> um, welcome to Monkey Time. My name is Todd. Oh, I'm over there. Welcome to Monkey Time. My name is Todd. And uh, we have a wonderful guest uh, for you tonight. Uh, Rob Schofield is here from uh, North Carolina Policy Watch. Right. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about yeah, the group and I'm, what you guys do? I'm thrilled to. Uh, thanks for having me, Todd. Oh, you're welcome. NC Policy Watch is a progressive nonprofit uh, advocacy and reporting organization. We are at ncpolicywatch.com. We are following all things pol political and policy-wise in the state legislature in North Carolina. If you want to know what's going on, you want to get progressive takes on what's going on, you want to read tweets and blogs, go to our website. My colleague Chris Fitzsimon has his own television and radio shows, and um, you know we're we're one of the most prolific, I'd say, commentators on state policy in North Carolina. And certainly the 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 most articulate and and uh, oh, most definitely. well well <laughs> uh, on the progressive side, you're you're one of the most um, well respected. Let me put well, it that way. There well, there are a number of others, but you you guys are definitely at the top. Both Chris and I have been around North Carolina politics for the better part of 20 years. I think Chris has probably been here 30 years. He was a reporter, and then he worked in the House of Representatives when Dan Blue was Speaker of the House. He's had he's run nonprofits. I've been a lawyer and a lobbyist for poor people for 20 years and uh, have been doing this commentary business for the last several. So I think we have a pretty good idea of what we're talking about. It's a pretty depressing time, isn't it? You've got the full, I mean, the reason I, I brought uh, Rob on, and, and we're going to continue doing some, some shows about North Carolina politics over the next few weeks, is that the, the Republican legislature is back in session, hide your children, and they are They've hit the ground running. Yeah. They've been planning for months in secret. And, and you know, not that Democrats didn't probably Absolutely. do something similar, but they've hit the ground running, and we, I feel powerless. But I watch the, the, the debacle happening, unfolding yeah. in front of me, and I want to know, it is, what can I do? What, well, how can we stay informed, and then how can we use our little power to influence it? It is like watching a train wreck in some respects. And these folks, there's a lot of the sort of Tea Party extremists who have really sort of seized control of the agenda for the Republicans in the General Assembly. It is a depressing time, and I don't want to sit here and pretend that by calling the offices of a Tea Partying, wild-eyed conservative lawmaker that a thoughtful progressive uh, viewer out there tonight's going to change their mind overnight. Save me my illusions. <laughs> Leave me my illusions. Well, maybe please. if enough of you did. <laughs> uh, but, but, but it's also true that there's no way that things are going to turn around, even in 2014 or 2016, if people just bury their heads in the sand and don't pay attention. Part of the reason that the right has had so much luck in sort of gaining power in state politics in North Carolina and around the country is because they've been paying attention. They have a lot of people who have been doing a lot of stuff like Chris and I do, a lot more people actually, sort of bang in the drum, and a lot of ideas that 30 years ago were thought of as these crazy extreme ideas like privatizing our public schools and turning them all over to fundamentalist churches are now sort of mainstream all of a sudden. And so we've got our work cut out for us, but the first step is for people to pay attention, start learning about what's going on. Yes, call your lawmakers, become involved in politics, vote, get ac active in campaigns, but all of that will be made much more effective if people know what the heck they're talking about and get active. And you have a, there were, there were a couple specific suggestions of lawmakers that might be worth um, um, focusing on locally in the, in the, the Wake County area. And we're going to put those contact, uh, inf that contact information up Good. later. Let's, let's talk about something vaguely positive from the North Carolina Policy Watch uh, website. Recently, the, the budget process, which looked initially like it was mm -hmm. just going to be a, a railroad, yeah. has, has gone off the fast track you guys posted at your blog. And, and we've now seemed to have a little bit more measured approach. Can you tell me more about that? Sure. And does that give us an opportunity to really affect some of the budget process. I think this is state. an example of where even very conservative people, ideologues who had an agenda, are sort of backing off a little bit because they're feeling the pressure, they're feeling the criticism that was that was uh, put on them about the fact that the budget was going to be passed on the first day of session. That's what they were initially saying. Really? Yeah, they were saying we're going to, you know, they've been cooking up the budget in the interim between last year's session and the months that we've been out of session. Insane. They came into session last week and they were talking about literally having it on the floor of the house the first day. That kind of talk has has evaporated. The best information we have now is that the budget's actually going to come out tomorrow morning, Thursday morning, and then l lawmakers will go home for an extended weekend. There'll at least be some time to review what's in there. But I think in general they're feeling a little bit sheepish, but I, I have no illusions that we're going to all of a sudden see a progressive budget or, or more revenue that would actually help us to plug some of the 
uh, you know, terrible holes that we have in the safety net in public education. So it's not like things are going to turn around, but again, there are some opportunities to at least perhaps correct some of the most egregious uh, errors that are in that budget. Well, let me ask you what those are in a second, but first, you're, you're saying that reven new revenue sources are essential. That's, that's the position of, uh, we have been, of, of, of yes. North Carolina Policy I mean, Watch? For the last few years, and it's, and it's happened under both Democrats and Republicans, the, the combined effect of the Great Recession, the end of federal assistance. You know, when President Obama came in, Congress stepped up to the plate and sent us hundreds of millions of dollars to keep teachers employed. That money all gone away since the Republicans took over in Congress. And then in the last General Assembly, or last year of the General Assembly in 2011, in this time of budget crisis, in a time when we couldn't even meet our basic obligations, the conservative Republicans came in and actually cut taxes further, cut taxes on corporations, cut taxes on very wealthy people, lowered the sales tax in the state. Isn't that a good thing to lower the sales tax, though, as a progressive? I mean, well, it's, an, it's, a, it's a regressive tax we hear right again about and again that. and again. If we, had to, if we had to design a new tax system in the state, and God knows we should, the sales tax would be changed dramatically. We would lower the rate and broaden the base, tax a lot more things at a much lower rate because rich people tend to buy services more than goods, and there's ways you could make the sales tax more progressive. But fair, having okay. said that, if your choice is between keeping a temporary extra penny on the sales tax, which mo pe most people don't notice and most people support, and firing thousands of teachers, I'm for keeping the sales tax. Yeah. Now, I think there are better ways to, to fund our state government. There are ways we could create new income tax brackets, for example, for wealthy North Carolinians, and plug most of the holes that we face right now. But and, and, and that's that, not going to happen under the general That increase on assembly. taxes for the wealthy. Um, that that's a that's a that's a winner in poll after poll after poll, yeah. and yet it hits this block at the legislative. <laughs> it's level. this block of very wealthy people who fund the campaigns of the people that are in the legislature. I'm okay, afraid. Okay. Well, now before we get too depressed, yeah. why is Bev Perdue? No, no. I mean, we want to we want to keep things relatively, you know, engaged. There is hope. There's still there, hope. There's there's hope, but there's also the more you do, the more you feel like you Absolutely. can do. That's you know, if well, you, you do, do what not you're talking thing, about, you, you're more you're more impactful. So, so on the state budget thing, you're saying there's, there are no, they're not planning any new revenue at all. Not at this point. And, no. and you think that's essential. So what, do you, what is your best outcome for the state budget at this point? It's going to be tough. I mean, I think what's going to happen is that they're going to try to uh, say that revenue is going to rise. They'll have more rosy figures for projecting what revenue is. You know, there's a little bit of wiggle room in how they can project the income that's going to come for the coming year. In other words, uh, they lie. They fudge <laughs> the numbers. OK, go ahead. I mean, that's, that's one possibility. But I mean, the, the bottom line is we're going to see cuts to education. We're going to see, uh, you know, incre we're going to have superintendents in local school systems with these so-called discretionary cuts in which they're going to have to come in and fire teachers, fire uh, essential personnel. And it's not the way we should be building our state. I think Meanwhile, that's Tom Tillis is giving severance packages <laughs> to his, his staffers who screw around with lobbyists. It is a rather stunning development. The speaker seems to be a little tin-eared when it comes to the notion that he was talking about, well, the reason I did this was because I was concerned about their families and the hardship that it would impose upon these people to all of a sudden have their salaries cut off. Meanwhile, there were a heck of a lot of, there were thousands of teachers and teacher's assistants. They didn't get a severance, pa a severance package. And indeed, the folks in charge want to cut back on unemployment insurance benefits in the state as well. Yeah, so that's another thing. How could you even propose that in this current climate? To, you would to, think. Well, yeah. the problem, of course, is that even, and under Democrats, admittedly, as well, in the 90s, we slashed unemployment insurance taxes so much that the, admittedly the fund is broke. It's, we're borrowing the money from Washington to pay people their right, unemployment right. benefits. But unemployment has kept tens of thousands of people afloat during the recession. It's kept grocery stores and restaurants and the places that where people spend their money. That money gets put directly money. back oh, into absolutely. the economy. An unemployed person doesn't take their benefits and right. buy luxury <laughs> items. No, not for $290 <laughs> a week, which is like what the average benefit is. Mm. So. Yes, we absolutely have to keep the unemployment insurance flowing. The only way we're really going to fix that situation is to get taxes back on, on employers to where they were in the 90s. Let me ask you about some of these. Uh, we're going to talk about Bev Perdue in a second because she's, she's well, l l but let me ask you about some of these Democrats that vote with the Republicans mm -hmm. consistently. Mm -hmm. One of them, thank God, Crawford, mm -hmm. um, who was the, the key vote on the abortion, the, the new abortion restrictions mm -hmm. that passed. He was a Democrat yeah. and he was promised some kind of committee chair and voted he with the Republicans. And he lost his primary. 
He lost his primary, and there's a lesson there. Yeah. And maybe that's a way I'm thinking, maybe naively, that we can put pressure on the legislatures by focusing on those handful, half dozen Democrats who consistently vote to override Bev Perdue's vetoes on things. It certainly can't hurt. In the long run, it can't hurt. You know, in the short run, I'm not sure it helps a whole lot because Crawford's back in the legislature as a lame duck now, and so he's probably not going to go out of his way to help the governor or Democrats yeah. uh, this session. We don't know. Perhaps he will. But um, I mean, I think in the long run, yes, that's what's going to have to happen. People who vote in a way that's contrary to the public interest, that's contrary to the to the progressive uh, uh, t tendencies of their party, are, they're not going to last. I, I think we're really seeing a sea change, too, in North Carolina politics, where we just don't have many Jesse Kratz, conservative Democrats are sort of a dying breed. And it's, it's truly the ideological lines are becoming much brighter between the two parties. How much can you count on Bev Perdue? Um, a, a, lot, a lot of people are hoping that, you know, now that she's retiring, that she'll go out in a blaze of left-wing glory. Well. <laughs> well, you know, we can dream, you know? I mean, it's better than the zombie dreams I usually have. Dreams of Bev Perdue in shining white armor saving North Carolina from the right-wing surge of the Tea Party. Well. Um, but here she is. She just proposed it proposes a cap on the gas tax yeah. in her budget. Yeah. She's not even waiting for the Republicans to, to do that, and she's not even up for re-election. Rob, help me understand <laughs> what Bev Perdue is thinking here. I think what you see is what you get with Bev Perdue. Bev Perdue has some very progressive things that she's for. She's pro-choice. She's you know good on some issues and other issues. She's basically doing what her heart tells her. That's what she thinks is right. I disagree with her a lot of the time, but she's basically a business-friendly, moderate to conservative Democrat on fiscal issues, on business issues. That's what she was for, de for decades, really, as a state lawmaker and as lieutenant governor. She's a good person. Uh, I, you know, at this point, quite frankly, it's, it's not clear how much oomph she really has left. Her term is ending. She has that veto. Well, she does. And she and, certainly and can, can, can stop proposing idiotic things <laughs> and let the Republicans propose them and take well, the hit. You know, and I think, yeah, I think the gas tax, unfortunately, it just, it polls well. People hate the gas tax, even though we yeah, know I do too. that's, yeah, yeah, we all do, but that's also how those potholes get filled. And that's how we might even think maybe someday about having you know, uh, rail transit and actual, you know, more uh, uh, available bus service for folks that want to live in a in a this urban culture that's sort of overtaking the triangle. Well, to me, it seems silly. The chances of the Republican legislature passing an increase on the gas tax well, right. are ridiculous. No, are ridiculously they low. They were going to pass. So for it. so for Bev Perdue to step forward and do that yeah. uh, for them is just well, why? It I, makes no sense. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I think it was a mistake. There's a new report out on our website this afternoon at ncpolicywatch.com from our colleagues at a group called the North Carolina Budget and Tax Center. There's some sort of budget wonks that work in our uh, umbrella organization where we're housed. Great folks with the numbers. And they did a, a report that just came out showing why capping the gas tax is probably going to be very bad for the state, keeping the roads up, keeping public transit a possibility. And, and we may come to regret it if we do indeed cap the gas tax. Which is going to happen probably. Seems likely. Seems we're likely. talking with Rob Schofield from the North Carolina um, uh, Policy Watch. Uh, the website's north ncpolicywatch.com. Right. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter. And in fact, there uh, there's his uh, his uh, Twitter handle. Yeah. Um, and it's a great way, you know, him and Chris Fitzsimon. It's a great way to to keep up with what's going on in North Carolina politics. There are a couple of other organizations we're going to be featuring over the next yeah. couple of weeks as well here on Monkey Time. Um, can we talk a little bit about uh, fracking? Sure. Now that's there's this huge push. Bev Perdue got a study commission she just announced. Right. Yeah. What's your what's your sense of where we're going to go with this? We had a um, we had a we we have these events we call crucial conversations. We had one in Raleigh last fall on this topic where we actually brought down some farmers from Pennsylvania who'd sort of had to live in the shadow of fracking operations, and they described in sort of really depressing detail how this stuff had transformed. The, the farming, what had once been sort of this bucolic farming community into this loud, dirty, unpleasant place. And I think that that's the concern that a lot of people have is that fracking, the idea is that we're going to shoot vast quantities of water and chemicals underground at high pressure and we'll free up all this trapped natural gas and it will produce all the energy we, we need for decades to come. But the latest studies show that it's probably only a few years worth of gas. North Carolina doesn't have very good deposits of it. It's in a narrow band in Lee and uh, Chatham counties. Uh, 
it's, it's something that really, North Carolina has, it's illegal in North Carolina because there's just never been a demand to do it. And what the legislature is trying to push, I think in sort of a, a they're reaching out to their Tea Party base, is, you know, the sort of drill baby drill base of the Republican Party, saying, come on, yeah, let's frack in North Carolina. But right now, I think even the economics make it, it it's not economically viable. There's no reason to rush. Uh, we, we, we have lots of studies that need to be completed, and I think if they are completed, they'll probably show us that it's not economically viable, it's going to be dangerous in a lot of communities, uh, it's going to leave a lot of damage, and it's not even going to create that many jobs or that much energy. So it's uh, something Can probably mostly a lose-lose. Uh, a lose-lose proposition. Can yeah. we talk about the, uh, the inflated, the, the ac mm -hmm. argument that um, the, the, uh, the reserves yeah. are being dramatically inflated by the fracking companies and the, the people that, for the people that they want to get investment money from. Well, sure. I mean, Tell me more about that. that well, you linked to the New York Times article um, on the ncpolicywatch.com th site. There's been a lot of uh, analysis. We have a great blogger at our website, Lisa Finaldi, who's a veteran environmentalist who writes on our blog, The Progressive Pulse, a lot about it. I'd say check out her blog post this morning about it. There's, I think the U.S. Geological Survey is sort of ratcheting back back how much they actually think is out there. Yes, it's obviously incumbent upon the industry to wants to get investors to come in to say, oh my gosh, yes, there's decades worth. It's all the energy that you know America needs for decades to come. But you know, we're, we're now, there are now indications from federal government research that that's probably well inflated. And again, in North Carolina, even the most optimistic uh, assessments of what's possibly here are pretty minimal. And given right now the actual low price of natural gas in the country, it's not even worth it for them to invest the money to do it. it yeah. If fracking were legalized tomorrow in North Carolina, and I hope it's not, we still wouldn't see drilling for many years, if at all. So why, I think we really need to, why go down this road? Everybody, the... Uh, it's scraping the bottom of the barrel of, so of, of squeezing of, the of sponge. fossil fuels. Yeah. The experts yeah. will tell you we could save more with just basic conservation measures than we'll ever recover through fracking. And we won't have uh, people's sinks exploding with natural gas coming out. We won't contaminate yeah. our groundwater, which new studies are showing that maybe the lines between where the gas is and where our groundwater uh, comes from are a lot narrower than originally And then maybe what do they, they do with thought. the groundwater and chemicals after <laughs> it's been fracked? After they send it, shoot it down in there under high pressure, causing earthquakes, right? Yeah. You know, which is what we've seen in Ohio. Yeah. I just want, Oklahoma. I just want monitoring, seismic monitoring. Yeah. That's all I ask, legislator, legislators. Just give me seismic monitoring and water, groundwater uh, testing around every one of these sites, and I'll be happy. That's not enough. I know it's stupid to even try it. Well, but but those two things are important. Well, and we know that you know in North Carolina we already have a water problem, right? I mean, it was yeah. just a couple of years ago here in the Triangle where we had this terrible drought. Huge we were drought. worrying. We've got yeah. this m massive population growth. Where the heck are we going to get water for the 21st century? Oh, that's a good idea. Idea. Let's take billions of gallons of fresh water and shoot it down underground to get with out chemicals. Natural, with chemicals mixed in it so they can never be used again. And then what are the rules for what you do with that wastewater when it when you bring it back out? Well, I'm sure you know there are rules, but I mean basically it has to go somewhere. It has to be somewhere where hopefully it won't mix with anything else or pollute anybody's land or but you know, that's really difficult to do. And as those of us in North Carolina who lived through Hurricane Floyd in nineteen ninety nine know that there are parts of our state that have a way of flooding uh, for weeks at a time at points, you know, hopefully not in the central part of the state, but it's been known to happen. And it's just, it's just I think, a, a, a road we really don't want to go down. I think that we'll regret it. And I'm, I'm still hopeful that the studies will get in place, will show us that it's not viable, and this sort of uh, little uh, flirtation we've had with fracking will sort of evaporate once the legislators go home. Once the, uh, the price of natural gas goes up enough, though, it's like the tar sand stuff. I just read recently yeah. at the oil drum site. Do you know the oil drum? It's a in oil What's industry uh, um, blog oh, slash I website. No, I don't they, know They, that they one, talked but. about how the, as long as um, oil stays crude, stays um, below 85 right. per, ga per barrel, it's not viable. Tar sands are not viable. But. <laughs> but as soon as it goes above, all of a sudden we can start doing tar sands. And that's the worst kind of oil. Yeah, yeah it's that's, just that's this very worrisome. They, that basically means that the, the, the public lands of the Western United States become exploitable. These yeah. beautiful, you know, pristine lands that are belong to all of us and are natural and free and open all of a sudden become the property of big energy companies. And it's it's very scary. One last question about fracking. We're talking with Rob Schofield from the North Carolina Policy Watch. 
Um, and Progressive Pulse is the is the blog, the yeah, regular right. ongoing Which blog. Which we welcome your participation in. Please yeah, it's a, join the they're, conversation. They're both great, great places to stay, stay in t touch with uh, progressive politics in North Carolina. One last thing on the fracking. Uh, yeah. Bev Perdue just released this executive order. Yeah. Um, what do you think the effect of that's going to be? Can you describe what she just She's did? basically saying, look, if we're going to study this, I'll be in charge of this, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I'm the governor here. The Department of Environment and Natural Resources reports to me. Um, you know, that's great. Uh, if the legislature wants to pass a law, though, that law that legalizes it or sets some other rules for how we're going to study it, that's within their power to do. She could then attempt to veto. We could set ourselves up for a battle over it. seems to me the common sense solution that pretty much everybody ought to agree to is we need to really understand what the heck this does. Even I think many conservative lawmakers think we ought to at least study it for a couple of years, and I think that's the most hopeful uh, result we'll get out of this 2012 session. We'll study it. Everybody can take a closer look at it, and then we'll fight over what the study says, but since it's not economically viable right now, there's no reason to legalize it tomorrow. And I think, I'm hoping that the way the gas companies have dicked over landowners in other states. Oh, can I say that, Carol? <laughs> you just did. <laughs> I, I accept full responsibility. I apologize if anyone, I hate that. Don't you hate that when they apologize <laughs> if anyone was offended? Um, no, the way, the way the gas companies have completely dicked over um, uh, landowners in other states with these horrible contracts. Oh, my goodness, um, yes. where, the, where the landowner then becomes responsible for all cleanup. Right. Hopefully, some, a conservative legislature would see that you would and say, think. that is atrocious. I mean, these farmers that we brought down for Pennsylvania weren't a bunch of bleeding heart liberals. They were, these were like dairy farmers, you yeah. know, salt of the earth type of people from the middle of Pennsylvania. They were just talking about how their roads had been destroyed, about how the noise of trucks running 24 hours a day, of the, just, you know, that their houses rattled and, and that they had bad tasting water. These just sort of basic things that, you know, conservatives don't like any of that stuff either in their backyard. And you'd think that if they went and looked at it, that a lot of people would come to their senses. Go a little slower. Okay. Rob Schofield, thank you so much. We've only got a few minutes left. Um, sure. Would you like to talk about the, uh, the, the, you talked about warehousing mentally ill people oh, in boy. North Carolina in um, a, a residences, uh, rest homes that yeah. are designed for elderly folks. Can this you can you tell me more about how that's happen, well, working the, out in North Carolina? If there's a place that people can find out about, and I want to say this before I forget, is a group called Disability Rights North Carolina. They have a website, Disability Rights. Look them up, Disability Rights North Carolina. They're great. They have done some wonderful advocacy on behalf of mentally ill people who the state of North Carolina just doesn't want to invest the resources. We talk about the budget in the General Assembly. Here's another example. We don't have a very powerful lobby group. There's no rich people buying, you know, political favors for people with mental illness. And lo and behold, what happens? The state deinstitutionalizes them. We don't want them all going to Dick's Hospital, so we'll send them into their communities. Well, where do we put them? Well, I don't know. We end up putting them in rest homes that were originally designed for senior citizens because they're cheap. And the industry comes in and says, yeah, sure, we'll take them off your hands. Yeah, for, for money. Sure, right? yeah. which is, you know, it's economically uh, feasible. But basically, people are smoking cigarettes and staying in their rooms for long periods of time. And, and not getting in, treatment. And not being rehabilitated or treated so that they can be integrated into the community as best as possible. I don't want to knock all these rest homes. There's some good folks who work there who care about the people that live in their homes. But that's not what they were designed designed to do. And if we want to have a system that truly serves people with mental illness, and we're talking like eight or 9,000 people in North Carolina who are living this way, we have to make the investments so that they have the adequate services that actually allow them to live near their families, have some hope of leading a normal life. And many, many of them could if we just made those investments. But it takes money and they're not you know, willing to do it. They the, talk a good game when they close the, 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 yeah, the, the hospitals, right. the mental health hospitals. They talk a good game about community care. Or this notion and that somehow the market is going to solve the problem, that they'll compete to provide the, you know, the service at the lowest price, as if a person with mental illness is going to be able to go out there and shop you know, for the uh, best services they can get. Mm. Uh, yes, you're right. They talk a good game. But unfortunately, it's a very diff it's a difficult thing for lawmakers to do, to appropriate that money. To do that when there isn't any big political payoff for it is difficult, but we need to do it. It's the right thing to do. Carol, can we put up number 17 for a second? Um, I asked you, I wanted to have some hopefulness. Um, and you know, I asked you for maybe some names of legislators in the, within the Wake yeah. County area that might be amenable. And one of the people you sent me was uh, Neil Hunt, who's one of the most anti-gay <laughs> legislators around. However, Neil, hi, how you doing? How's the yeah. wife? Um, uh, well, I've chatted with both of them. Yeah, well, um, not very productive chatting, but but um, but 
still, they're local and they seem on some way, in some ways to be less doctrinaire than some of the others. Can you tell me where these names came from as possible people that you, if you feel like getting involved, can just send an email to and say, look, I'm concerned about fracking or I'm concerned that we do this right or I'm concerned about the way mentally ill people are being underfunded in I North think Carolina. particularly when it comes to the state budget, these lawmakers represent a lot of public employees. That's who you know is the biggest employer in this area. They're not in the business of wanting to get rid of government. And the folks at TogetherNC, TogetherNC.org, which is a, a fine uh, a coalition of nonprofits working on a fair, adequate, stable state budget. TogetherNC. TogetherNC.org. They have. Those are among the people that they are trying to reach out to. Those are Republican lawmakers based here in Wake County. Again, nobody has any illusions that we're going to turn these very conservative lawmakers into progressives overnight. But they're people that need to hear, they need to hear from Wake County residents. They need to hear from their constituents that they're not satisfied with the way the state budget is going. The fact that lawmakers are talking about firing more teachers rather than rebuilding the damage from the Great Recession. We ought to be going forward, recovering from the problems that were uh, uh, wrought by the Great Dis Recession instead of just sort of taking ourselves continually backwards and you know repealing the progress we've made over the last couple decades. And those people, they need to hear it whether they're going to change their minds tomorrow. Probably not, but they need to start hearing from people regularly. And one of the, two minutes, is that what you said? Okay, thanks. One of the things that I think is interesting is that even though the Republicans have gerrymandered all these districts <laughs> so that they, 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 that a lot of these Republicans, just like the Democrats did yes, way no back doubt. when, Brad Miller did it in 2000. I was there. I saw it. it I called him that, out for doing yes, it. Yes, they did it. Although it is true that with modern computer technology, the Republicans have just done it more efficiently. Much more efficiently. Much more effectively. But my, my point is that even with all that, yeah. even with the gerrymandering that makes Republican districts, or, or that lean so heavily towards the incumbent, a Republican incumbent that's hard to fight. Even so, in most of these elections, the voter turnout is still relatively yeah. low. And a sudden surge in voter turnout from left-leaning or I'm an independent, registered right. independent, independent voters could really shock the crap out of these people. So I think they know that at some small level. They're not totally safe. Well, that's they why worry they've been trying the to pass laws to make it harder for to people make, to vote. To make it harder for, yeah, yeah, like they the voter ID laws. They are concerned about that. You're mm. absolutely right. And a high, the high turnout that happened in the 2008 election with President Obama and the excitement, that changed the legislature. And then in 2010, everybody went to sleep. Nobody voted. Lo and behold, we have a very Look, conservative happened? general assembly. So, so some of these, so an, uh, uh, a consistent set of polite emails to these people, polite but forceful emails, Call me naive. <laughs> I think it has a small cumulative effect. And the more of us that do it, the cumulative effect gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and it's an easy thing to do. You feel involved. You take the next step. You Absolutely. take the next step. So I, I, I know that sounds naive. And, and all my anarchist friends are just like, oh, God, he's saying, write your congressman. Oh, what an idiot. But I believe that it can work, at least somewhat. So anyway, Overtime. thank you, sir.